have joined us to worship today. We're starting a new series um, on the cross as we move towards Good Friday and Easter Sunday. We want to take a few weeks just to prepare our hearts uh, and remind ourselves about Jesus and about the cross and about this incredible thing that Jesus did for us when he died for our sins. We know from history that dying on the cross was a horrible way to go. When a person was crucified, uh, their body was placed along the vertical plane of that cross and their feet were either nailed or they were tied with ropes uh, or both at the middle point of that vertical plane of the cross and then their hands were tied and nailed to the horizontal plane of that cross. Usually the cross was placed along a roadside or the top of a hill so that many people could see it and some ancient historians describe walking down highways And there are dozens of people being crucified. And as you move down this highway, you could see person after person hanging there up on their cross. And in some cases, it would take days to die with no food and no water. People walking by you, some people stopping just to talk about you dying right there in front of them. As, and, and so dying on a cross was a horrible way to go. It was a humiliating uh, way to go. It was emotionally painful. Dying on the cross was humiliating. It was designed to humiliate the person who was dying. That's why they were placed where everyone could see them. The cross was humiliation. Jesus experienced betrayal at the cross. All of his friends had ran off and left him when he needed them the most. Jesus was humiliated. The cross meant defeat. When someone hung on a cross, it was a sign that Rome had defeated you. You had fought Rome and you had lost. You had tried to either rise up against Rome or you had broken the laws of Rome and the Roman Empire has defeated you. They have vanquished you as their foe if you died on a cross. The cross was a painful way to die. In Jesus' case, he was whipped and beaten. Uh, The whip the Romans used was called the cat of nine tails. It was a whip that had nine rope ends on it, and each of the ends had a jagged piece of metal material tied onto it, and this whip ripped into Jesus' flesh, into his skeletal tissues, into his vital organs. In fact, one of the reasons that Jesus only lasted one day on the cross is because of this beating that he suffered The the cross was just the final straw. Uh, But Jesus, his flesh was torn open. He had lost so much blood already. He was beaten, he was bloodied, and already dying even before they hung him on that cross. And then the crucifixion itself, they took spikes and pounded them into his hands and his feet. And just to breathe, Jesus actually had to lift his back. And you think of all the shredding and the bleeding from the whipping And he would have to lift it up as it grated against this wooden cross just to get a gulp of air. So the cross was physically painful. It was a form of humiliation. It represented defeat at the hands of the Roman Empire. And this begs the question, why would anybody want to die on a cross? Why would anyone want to go to a cross and die that kind of death Jesus said that he chose the cross, that he willingly laid down his life on the cross for you and for me. We know that Jesus did this willingly because in John chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus says, the Father loves me because I sacrifice my life and take it up again. That phrase, sacrifice my life, refers to his death on the cross. That phrase, so I take it up again, refers to his resurrection from the dead. So Jesus is saying, the Father loves me because I am going to the cross and because I'm going to rise from the dead. Interesting statement. And then Jesus says this, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and to take it up again for this is what my Father commanded. In Jesus' statement here, we see three things that are very important. First of all, no one could take Jesus' life from him. This means that Jesus chose when he was going to die. He was protected from death until the right time, the time when he chose to willingly die. It also means that he chose the cross as the form of his death. In the events leading up to the cross, and as all of these events are unfolding, Jesus knew where this was going, and Jesus knew that he was going to die by crucifixion. So Jesus chose the when, and Jesus chose the how of his death. No one can take my life 
from me. Jesus also voluntarily sacrificed his life. No one was forcing him to do this. Jesus was making a choice that he wanted to make. And we've seen in the Genesis series that we just finished the importance of choice. When human beings got into this mess in the first place, sin was introduced into the world by human choice. And Adam and Eve chose to disobey God. And even after the fall, Cain has a choice and he chooses to disobey God. He chooses the pathway of sin. And every day we have a choice whether we're going to obey God and follow God or not. And we know right from wrong. Uh, We know what sin is. We know what sin is not. And even as Christians, sometimes we choose, even though we know better, sometimes we choose to sin. We choose to disobey God. We choose to go against God for a season in our lives. Now, that season usually turns out very badly in the end when we choose to go against God. Things go well for a time because we're kind of living off of the residual blessings of walking with God. But over time, the more that we ignore God and the longer we leave God out of the picture, the more sin gets a grip on our lives and eventually life starts to go very badly. So we've all chosen to sin. We've all chosen to go against God. And it's important that Jesus has a choice to save us from sin because human choice got us into this mess, the mess that the entire world is in. It's important that Jesus is able to say, I voluntarily lay down my life. I choose to lay down my life. The first Adam chose to disobey God. Jesus is known as the second Adam And he chooses to obey God and go to the cross and deal with the results of sin that the first Adam caused. In other words, it is really important that Jesus has this choice. Jesus chooses to sacrifice his life. He lays down his life voluntarily. And as you and I go into the Easter season, as we lead up to Good Friday, where we remember the crucifixion, and as we lead up to Easter Sunday, where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, I encourage you just to take some time and to ponder this statement that Jesus makes here. No one takes my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. Jesus chose to go to the cross for you and for me. What can you choose for him? Jesus gave up his life for you and for me. What can you give up for him? Jesus chose to enter into death. What can you die to for him? In Christian tradition, there's something called Lent, and, and Lent is a preparation season before Easter. And often people will give up something for Lent. People will give up movies for Lent, or they'll give up chocolate for Lent, or they'll give up sugar for Lent. And the idea is because Jesus gave up something for us, what can I give up for him? Is there anything that I can die to during this season leading up to Good Friday? Is there anything that I can die to out of respect for Jesus dying for me and what he did for me? Think about that. As we walk through the coming weeks in the Easter season, maybe there is something in your life that you want to give up, that you want to release to God, and maybe just for this season, or maybe it's something you want to give up permanently. Third thing we see here is that it is the Father's will for the Son to have this choice. It's important to God and to the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Spirit. It's important for God that Jesus has this choice as a human being to voluntarily give up his life for you and for me. Okay, so Jesus did have the choice. We see that from John 10, verse 18, that Jesus did indeed have the choice to go to the cross. It was not something that was forced on him. He chose to walk this path of suffering, of humiliation, of defeat, of pain, and finally of death. So why would Jesus go to the cross? Why would Jesus do this? Well, first of all, Jesus died to bring you back to God. When you see, when Adam sinned, humanity was separated from God. We had no way to get back to God. In fact, the Bible tells us that we were enemies of God. Did you know that? Before you received Jesus, before you believed Jesus is your Savior and Lord, you were God's enemy. Now, that doesn't have to mean that you were an active enemy. It can mean that you were simply on a different side in the battle like what's happening between Russia and the Ukraine. Technically, they're enemies, but most individual people, they would say, well, you know, we're enemies, but it's because we're on different sides of this battle. I don't really have an issue with this other person. Maybe because we were just not on God's side, 
were an enemy of God. Some of you, before you became to know Jesus, you were maybe very active, trying to get people to turn away from God. And, but most of you probably didn't do that. Most of you were just going about life, trying to do your thing, and yet you weren't God's friend. You weren't on God's side. So in that sense, you were an enemy of God, and you needed to be reconciled to God. Reconciled means to settle or resolve a dispute. So you were in a dispute with God. God, I don't believe in you. God, I don't believe that you're there. Or God, I believe that you're there, but I refuse to obey you. I refuse to allow you to be the Lord of my life. I refuse to offer you my allegiance. So God, you're there, but you're not Lord of my life. So I'm at odds with you. I am in a dispute with you over who is in charge of my life. And that is where we were at with God. We were at a, in a dispute with God over who was Lord of our lives. So we needed to be reconciled to God. This dispute between us and God needed to be resolved. Look at this, Romans 5 verse 10. It says, for if, while we were God's enemies, so we were on separate sides of a dispute and we were not on God's side, we were far away from God. In that sense, we were enemies of God. So for if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through this life? So how are you reconciled, or through his life? So how are you reconciled? If you wanted to get back to God, how would you do that? You can only be reconciled to God through the death of his son. And that's the only way you can be reconciled. Jesus had to die in order for us to be reconciled to God. And that means that reconciliation costs something. It cost Jesus everything. It cost him all of the pain, all of the suffering that he endured Another meaning of the word reconciled means to bring into close relationship. And in that sense, you needed somebody to bring you back home. Look at this. First Peter says this, Christ suffered for our sins once for all. He never sinned. Now, this is an idea that's repeated often throughout the New Testament. Peter says this. Paul says this. These are men who knew Jesus all of his adult life. These are men who knew Jesus' family members. And they make this claim about Jesus that he never sinned, meaning that he suffered for our sins, but he didn't deserve to die. The cross was an unjust suffering. Jesus was an innocent man choosing to suffer for all of us who are guilty of sinning because none of us can say that we are without sin. None of us can say that we've never sinned. Only Jesus is able to say that. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners. And why did he die? To bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. So Jesus died to bring you close to God. Now, if you are here or if you're listening online and you do not yet trust Jesus as your Lord, this means that you are far away from God, just like the rest of us were at one time. And no matter what you do, you cannot earn your way back to God. No matter how hard you try, you cannot reconcile yourself. You need a mediator. You need someone who is sinless, someone who is perfect to enter into the picture and to bring you back to God. And for those of you who do say, Jesus is Lord of my life, this is something that you need to identify with and just let this soak into your spirit because you are reconciled. That is true about you. In Christ, you are reconciled. You've been brought home. You are at peace with God. And that is something to celebrate. That is something that should put a smile on your face. That's something that should bring joy into your spirit. So Jesus died to bring you close to God. Jesus also died to set you free. We talked about this in the Genesis series. What are the three things that happened to humanity when we chose to go against God? Well, first thing, sin entered the world. We were bound up by the power of sin. Second thing, we entered into an, elite, an alliance with the devil. We were bound up by the power of the devil. Third thing, we became spiritually dead and physical death entered the world. Those are the three things that we saw in the book of Genesis. Well, in the New Testament, we learn that Jesus has come, and one of the reasons he has come and has come to die is he is setting us free from each of these three things. Jesus sets us free from these three great bondages that we struggle with. 
And now for those who trust Jesus, you are free from the power of sin. Take a look at what Paul says in Romans 8, verse 2. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. So the power of sin that was introduced to the world through Adam and Eve, through Cain, the power of sin that, that placed the world in bondage, the power of sin that still has such a devastating effect on our lives, this power of sin has been defeated in those who belong to him. This is for those who belong to Jesus. The power of sin has been defeated in your life. So you are free from the power of sin. You're also free from the power of the devil. Uh, a lot of people these days don't believe in a devil or Satan or what is happening in the spiritual realm, but the Bible actually has a lot to say about the spiritual realm. That is a realm of, of angels and demons and, and the spiritual warfare that is going on in the world around us. And this spiritual warfare is something that we can't always see. It's happening in the spiritual realm, uh, but it affects the physical realm. And all throughout the, the scriptures, we see this theme that there's a spiritual realm and that there is a battle that is waging between angels and Satan and his demons. And we see it in the life of Jesus. Jesus casts out demons that were controlling people's lives. Jesus casts out demons that, that held people in sickness. It's one of the main things that Jesus did. He cast out demons. So we shouldn't be surprised as Christians to learn that there's a spiritual battle that's going on around us because Jesus was engaged in that same spiritual battle. And for everyone that's outside of Christ, you are in some sense under the authority or the influence of the devil. And for everyone that's inside of Christ, you are set free from the power of the devil. Take a look at Hebrews 2.14. It says this, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the son also became flesh and blood, for only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Okay, there's a lot to unpack, but the main point I want to make is that only by dying could Jesus break the power of the devil. And then it says, who held the power of death. And if you think about this, when you're in bondage to the devil in some way, all he wants to do is bring death into your life. This is what he wants to do. He wants to bring death. Uh, when I was growing up, as some of you know that my parents were foster parents, and we had 43 different foster brothers and sisters come into our home over the years. And, and I got to meet so many different people and hear about so many different life stories and there were many examples of how the devil had just wormed his way in and he had got his way into a family or into the life of a father or into the life of a mother and it only brought death. The devil's work in that person's life did not bring good things for them and their family. It only brought death. We had one girl who was raised by an abusive father. Her father was bound up by alcohol and by rage and by anger and the devil had control of his life. He really did. And one night, in a drunken rage, he took his little girl and he threw her across the room. And this little girl, who was born with a normal mental capacity, now suffered from permanent brain damage. And she came into our home just the sweetest person that you could ever meet. But she would never be the same. And when the devil gets a foothold in your life by way of anger or rage or drunkenness, the devil does not bring life. He brings death every single time. Now God came into her life and he redeemed her story. And she never fully recovered her mental capacity, but she ended up meeting a really good man later on in life, someone who treated her well. So God was able to redeem some of the damage that the devil had done. The devil brings death. That is his motive. That is what he wants to do. But Jesus, by his death on the cross, he breaks the power of the devil. And we don't have to embrace that life anymore. We don't have to be brought into that cycle of death. We can enjoy the cycle of abundant life that God wants for us to have. So you're free from the power of sin, you're free from the power of the devil, and you're free from the fear of death. Hebrews goes on to say, only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Only by dying on the cross could Jesus set us free 
from the fear of dying. And I've seen this many times when I do a funeral for a family who was solidly in Christ where the whole family understood that there's a resurrection, that there's a future, that there is a hope for this person. They are now in heaven and they're celebrating with God and they are enjoying all of the beauty and all of the enjoyment of our ultimate home because this is not our home. We are just passing through. This world is not our home. Our home is in heaven. Our home is with Christ. Our ultimate destination, our ultimate goal is what actually happens after we die after we pass from this life and we enter into heaven and we see Jesus face to face and we experience a new body and there is no more pain and there are no more tears and there's no more sadness for the old things have passed away and all things have become new. That is our ultimate home. And when I do a funeral for a family who understands that, you can just see the difference. There's just a peace, no fear of death, no fear of dying, just faith. Because for all those who are in Christ, we've been set free from the fear of dying. Okay, so Jesus has set us free from sin, from the power of the devil, from fear of death. But one question I get often from people is, why am I not experiencing this freedom? Why am I not experiencing this freedom? You know, Steve, it seems like there's just so many promises about my identity in Jesus, about what my life can be like in Jesus. And I am struggling because I am not experiencing all of these things. Is there something wrong with me? Is this normal? Am I alone here? Why am I not experiencing this freedom? Well, that's the experience of many people who come to Christ. So what is going on here? You see, Jesus died so that you could have life and your life could have a new momentum. Jesus offers a momentum that leads towards freedom in other words, when you accept Christ and you invite Jesus to be your Lord of your life, you should experience, uh, you should expect that you'll experience more and more healing in different areas of your life. Past hurts that you have experienced can be healed in Jesus. Past habits that used to control you can be overcome in Jesus. Past mistakes that used to hang over you like a dark cloud can be forgiven in Jesus. These kind of things are the kind of thing, changes that we can expect in our life. If, tr if Jesus has truly died for our sins and, and we are set free from the power of the devil and from the power of sin and from the power of death, we should expect that we're going to experience some changes in our spiritual life, in our spiritual growth. We should experience more freedom and new freedom, and yet so many of us are not. So what happens when your life does not live up to the potential of the cross? What happens when you look at all of these promises that you have in Christ and you look at your own life and you say, man, I am not seeing this. I wish I was free from sin, but in reality, I'm struggling with sin in my life. I wish I were free from bondage to the devil, but in reality, it seems like there is so much bondage in my life. I wish I were free from the fear of dying. I wish I felt more spiritually alive. Man, I wish that were true, but the reality is that some days, many days, I just don't feel it. And I get discouraged. We get discouraged in our faith when we want to give up, we want to stop trying. And we say, Jesus, I just don't see in reality what you have promised me in your word. And we start to ask, why am I not experiencing this freedom? Well, here is what is happening. When you come to Christ, your life has a momentum that is going in the opposite direction of where Jesus is taking you. And it simply takes time to change the momentum of your life. And there are four reasons why spiritual change is so difficult, and these are all legitimate reasons. The first has to do with the mind. You are free in principle, but you are stuck in a bondage mentality. Even though Jesus has set you free from the power of sin, if you still see yourself as a sinner, you will keep on sinning. If you don't understand that your identity has changed, that the power of sin has been broken in your life, then you will keep on going back into your old life of sin. Your momentum will carry you back into your old life. So you can be free in principle, but you can still have a bondage mindset. The second reason you're stuck is emotional. 
and you are free in principle, but you feel emotionally defeated. Sometimes we're just so tired and so discouraged and we're just kind of trying to press on, but we just can't summon up the emotional energy that we need to move ahead. Third reason you're stuck is spiritual. You're free in principle, but still spiritually bound by your hurts, by your habits, and by your hangups. You still have habits in your life that are keeping you from really being set free. You still have hurts in your life that are, you're struggling to forgive. You're struggling to get over those hurts in your life. The fourth reason you are stuck has to do with skills. You are free in principle, but you're still learning how to live out your freedom in Christ. And there's actually a skill to learning to live out all of these things that Jesus died for you to, to be. And just like with any skill, it takes time to learn. This is what discipleship is all about. Discipleship is about learning how to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to change the momentum of your life. There's a story in the Bible about a man that Jesus met. He met him at the pool of Bethsaida. And the pool is surrounded by hundreds of people and they're all in bondage. They're all people who are suffering in some way. They're blind, they're lame, they have some other issue. And all the people are there at this pool because they believe that once in a while an angel comes down and stirs up the water and the first one into the water after the angel stirs up the waters is gonna be healed. And so they're there waiting for this mysterious move of God to somehow heal them. And Jesus meets a man who's been there for 38 years. And Jesus asks him this question. He says, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? It sounds like a strange question. Jesus, of course I want to get well. That's why I've been sitting here for 38 years and waiting for this miracle move of God so that I can get well. Of course I want to get well. But sometimes we grow used to being stuck in a bad story. We grow used to being stuck in bondage. There's actually comfort in bondage. And looking out at a life where we are set free, we don't know what that life could look like. Sometimes we're so attached to our wounds that they have been become a part of us and a part of who we are. And so Jesus asked this man, do you want to get well? Do you really want it? And then the man brings up all of his excuses. He says, well, you know, you know I don't have anyone in my life to help me into the water when it's stirred up. It's just me. And when I'm trying to get into the water, somebody else gets in ahead of me. So he has all of these excuses. In other words, it's not my fault. It's everybody else's fault. This is just how it is. This is just my life. And this guy is clinging to his old identity and blaming his condition on people around him. And he was stuck in his excuses. And he basically says, the momentum of my life is against me. I can't be made well because the momentum of my life is against me. Here's the thing. Sometimes we prefer to live in the, the certainty of our dysfunction rather than embrace the uncertainty of change. That's where this guy is at. He would rather live in the certainty of his dysfunction than live in the sufficiency of what Jesus is ready to do for him. And then Jesus says to him, okay, if you want to get well, then pick up your mat and start walking. You see, the first step to freedom is a decision to take up your mat. And in this case, take up your new identity. Don't get stuck in your old identity. Well, you know, I'm just a sinner. No, you're not a sinner. Jesus died to free you from that. Jesus died to set you free from the power of sin. You are not a sinner. You don't have to sin. You don't have to stay in that prison. You don't have to stay in bondage to whatever it is that you're in bondage to. You have already been set free. The man gives all kinds of excuses and Jesus just says, take up your mat and walk. And Jesus is saying to you and to me, hey, I set you free. I set you free from the power of sin. I set you free from the power of the devil. You don't need to hang on to that old stuff anymore. Let me tell you a secret. Everything is already there in Christ for you to be free. But when you come to Christ, the momentum of your life is against you. The skill of learning to walk in the freedom that Jesus has given 
is learning how to shift the momentum of your life so that you can learn to experience freedom. And it takes a little bit of effort on your part. There is everything that Jesus has done for you, and then there is discipleship. And discipleship is where you take up what Jesus has done for you, and you get up, and you start to walk in it. And this involves training your mind in your new identity. How do you shift the momentum of your thought life? Well, it involves spending time reading the Bible, spending time in prayer, talking with God, and allowing the power of the Spirit of God to start to change you from the inside out. And that takes discipline. It involves training your heart. And sometimes you need to grab onto the will of others while you are gaining strength because you can't do it on your own. And if you are emotionally discouraged, you just can't do it. This man by the pool, what's his excuse? Well, I have no friends to help me, right? We all need friends. We all need support, even more so in the Christian life because it's not an easy life. And we weren't meant to do this on our own. We need support and we need friendships. We need others to pray for us. We need to offer support to others. We have about 27 small groups that meet in homes and they meet in, for Bible studies here at the church. They study the Bible together, they pray for each other, they care for each other, and maybe you need to join one of these groups. Or maybe you need to start a group of your own with some of your friends. We can help you to do that, but you cannot do this alone. Spiritual growth also involves spiritual freedom. How are you gonna break free from some of your old habits and some of your hangups? We actually have some people on our prayer teams who are trained to help people to find spiritual freedom from some of their habits, some of their addictions, some of their past hurts, some of their struggles, things that you're struggling to be set free from. If you need help in that, please call us. We would love to help you and set up a, a, a time that you can meet with some of our prayer team. And it involves learning the skill. This is where you need a mentor in your life. You need someone who has been there to come alongside of you and to help you and to give you advice, to help you learn the skills that you are gonna need to start to walk out all of these things that Jesus has done for you at the cross. You see, Jesus died to make you a new person. The Bible tells us that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, the new life has come. Jesus died on the cross so you could have momentum. Jesus didn't die on the cross so that you could stay stuck where you're at. Jesus died on the cross so that you could get up and walk. And when Jesus says to this man, get up and walk, there's, a, there's actually a physical healing that Jesus has already done. There's something tangible that Jesus has done physically to this man's body, and he gets up and walks. And Jesus says to you and to me, get up and walk. And there is a spiritual healing that Jesus has done. There, Jesus has done something tangible within you that enables you to get up and walk. So Jesus says, get up and walk. Start to build some momentum in your life. Start to learn how to take up your new mindset. Start to learn how to deal with those emotional disappointments. Start to learn how to deal with your habits. Start to learn the new skills that you're going to need. In other words, start to be a disciple of Jesus, right? And you can see with all of that in play, it's going to take some time. This man, he gets up and he walks, but then he has to get a new job because he can't keep his old job as a beggar anymore. He has to get a new life. He has to learn how to move forward after being lame for so many years. Jesus gives you a new life, and now it is going to take a lifetime to learn how to move forward after being in bondage for so many years. But the only way you're going to get there is get up and walk. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? Father God, we come to you today, and we're just so grateful for the cross. We're grateful for Jesus, for what you did there, that you chose willingly to sacrifice yourself for me and for each and every one of the, these people in this room. 
and each and every person who's watching online. You chose that. And we will be forever grateful, Jesus, that you did that for us. Thank you that you set us free from the power of sin, that you set us free from the power of the devil, that you set us free from the fear of dying and from spiritual death. You made us alive in Christ. And now I pray, Jesus, that you would help us to take up this path of discipleship and get up and take our mat and follow you. Help us, Lord God, to learn a new mindset. Give us a new mindset. Help us, oh God, to walk through the, the emotional struggles that we're coming through. Help us, Lord Jesus, to deal with our habits and our hurts and our hangups and to find freedom from those habits. Help us, Lord Jesus, to learn the skill of being a disciple so that we can experience, not just in the life to come, but in this life as well, we can experience some of the tangible things that you've promised. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and give you his perfect peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Have a fantastic day. Be blessed. Take care.